Okay, thank you, um, Jeremy, and thank you, Phil. And it's great uh, not just to invite me, but also to invite uh, members of our club as well. So it's if, if there's any one positive that's come out of the last 12 months that we've all been living through across the entire planet, um, on amateur radio, it's definitely spurred a great deal of new interest. And I think the Zoom meetings that we've been holding and the collaboration between different clubs, uh, we've, we've had several joint meetings with other clubs and more to come in the future, I'm quite sure. And what that means is we're all getting new ideas and new thoughts and new things to talk about and think about. So um, that's definitely a positive that we can all talk about. Um, I, I called my talk um, Stealth Antennas in the Real World, some ideas from G4IWO. I can't be the only person in the room here who lives in, and has lived all my life actually, um, in houses or flats where putting up external antennas has been utterly impossible in many cases or very difficult or, or very confined. Uh, but I have been an active radio amateur uh, for more years than I ought to confess um, and I'll come to that in a second. But I just want to first of all share with you this picture here. Uh, this is the back part of the back fence of my garden and this uh, i'm just gonna i'm gonna put up a poll and ask people here how many antennas can you do you think you can see in that picture uh, and i'm just gonna run the poll and uh, click on one of the answers and we'll just see where people have got and the talk itself at the end will answer it So at the moment, uh, two antennas is in the lead. Good thing I didn't put any money on this one. And whoever the the uh, the person online is suggested, I've got six six antennas there. Um, <laughs> actually, they're not far wrong, but they're not all in the picture. Right. So most people have voted. I'm just going to share that because it's just a bit of fun, really, uh, just to get people having a look at my picture there and just wondering how many antennas I've got in the uh, in the back of my garden there. So I'm just going to share the results with you. Um, so uh, two was top. So 44% of you uh, thought uh, it was uh, two antennas. 15% um, said one. And 25% said three. One person said six. Four people said five. So quite, quite an interesting range there. So hold on to that thought. I'll probably come back to that at the end and we'll answer the question, which may or may not surprise you. So um, what I want to do is to just kind of talk us through uh, what I said, and that is antennas in the real world. Uh, you mentioned when you were talking there, and this was uh, shared with me by Rob Sherwood, uh, who came and spoke at Denby Dale a few months ago at the beginning of the year uh, on the work he does on transceiver performance. And this is his QTH, or one of his QTHs, and the antenna farm at that QTH, which is just amazing. Uh, and I guess most of us would love to have one of those um, masts up with areas on the top. Our XYLs might not, and the neighbours might not, but uh, we'd all love to have one of them. But uh, uh, that's, that's uh, Rob's antenna farm. Um, and it's something that I guess many of us operate when we get an opportunity at things like special events, at special stations, 
uh, and even on things like field days if people are ambitious to put up a beam. But to uh, hold that dream thought, let's come back to the real world. And I want to just start very briefly with my amateur radio hobby. Um, I am an amateur amateur. Um, I have got no, no, I've had no technical involvement in electronics, communications, telecommunications in my entire amateur radio history. Um, I started off, as you can see, this is my dad uh, I, uh, with him. I took that picture in 1965. Um, and uh, that's the first radio that uh, that he built uh, which was an amcw uh, transmitter on the left and on the right many of you will recognize the old marconi cr100 uh, which was the radio that i used as a shortwave listener at, uh, at at a very tender age so i came into the hobby um elmwood if you like by my dad who very much was of the group of amateurs in that era who built everything. So uh, we built um, a number of things. So I, one of the things that he got me to build was um, a receiver, which was a, a regenerative receiver, two valve receiver. Um, and it went on from there, including of course, building aerials. And of course, inevitably, the first antenna we managed to put up in our house was a G5RV that uh, we put up courtesy of a landowner at the back who allowed us to run most of the antenna over his land at the back. Um, and uh, that was the first aerial that we used on HF together. Uh, we also went on a journey to learn Morse code together. Um, and some of you might recognize the old Columbia record a uh, long playing record that we use to learn Morse code. Uh, the fantastic thing for people in this call here tonight who are still struggling to learn Morse code or the bad thing, depending on where, you, where you're coming at it from, uh, when you're very young, you can learn it very quickly and the older you are, it takes you longer. So I can remember my dad and I sat down in 1965 or 64 to learn Morse code together and uh, it took me about three weeks to get to 12 words per minute. It took my dad at least three months, um, poss possibly a bit longer. Uh, that was actually my first ever contact uh, just after I'd passed the RAE as a very young boy. I got my amateur radio certificate, so I was operating using my dad's call sign then. I didn't get mine actually till a bit later because I dropped out of the hobby for a few years, got other interests in life. And that, uh, that QSL card to my dad was my first ever contact um, on 80 meters, I think it was, um, uh, with uh, G6OZ, who of course is uh, a silent key now. So I just want to mention that because uh, I was reminded uh, this morning uh, on our Denby Dale Facebook page, uh, one of our newish club members who's recently got his M7 call put up a message on Facebook saying that he just wanted some advice about an HF antenna and what sort of antenna he should put up in a very small garden. And both uh, Darren, who's on the call tonight, G0BWB, who's the ex-chairman of Denby Dale Radio Club, and myself both came in with various suggestions. And in fact, I'll pick up a couple of my suggestions in the talk tonight. Uh, which I've already given in part to Andrew, but uh, hopefully he will either be on the call here tonight or will watch the video afterwards. Um, I had the, the fortune or the misfortune of in the 1970s living on the second floor of that block of flats in South East London in Deptford. And uh, as you can see, we had, that was the, the only balcony was the walkway into the house, into the flat and there was no other uh, balcony the other side. Uh, it was just a straight window drop to the road beneath. There was a main road the other side of the block of flats. So that's where I lived. Definitely a very, very challenging environment to be a radio amateur. And I have to say, uh, breaking what I've discovered since then, in, when I was living uh, in that block of flats in the uh, uh, mid to late 1970s, 
Uh, I, I bought an antenna uh, from um, someone uh, who you'll recognize in a second. That was, that was me uh, on uh, using a KW204 um, and uh, I was operating 150 watts of CW. Uh, was delighted, I've still got my logbook from those days, uh, to work in my very early days uh, in the 70s uh, VK on uh, on CW using 150 watts. My antenna was this. Uh, one or two of you might have heard of what was called the Partridge joystick, uh, G3 VFA, uh, and he sold this. Um, and uh, people bought these antennas uh, that uh, was uh, basically a, a metal pole with a coil wound on it. Um, fed by a uh, what he called the joy match an ATU and then into the radio but if you can look at the cartoon picture at the top of the picture there of the antenna against the wall and uh, someone operating on it that was me in that block of flats in the 1970s in southeast London although of course if we look at the uh, latest EMF uh, stuff from Ofcom I think I'd have struggled to have said there was a separation distance between me and that antenna when I was putting out 150 watts of CW from 26146s in the output of that radio uh, in, uh, in the uh, 1970s. But nevertheless, it worked and I was able to literally to, to get around the world. Uh, in, in later life, and, and I think in all my um, uh, places I've lived in, I've travelled around quite a bit, lived in London and South East London and Suffolk and Essex and uh, now up here in Yorkshire. Uh, in where, Wherever I've lived uh, in my life, I've always put up a radio aerial in my adult life and been active on all HF bands on the radio. And I just wanted to just do an illustration of uh, what I managed to put up in this very small garden here, as you can see here uh, in the picture here. I mean, this garden was, must have been, it looks a bit longer in that photograph, but about 30 foot long. And uh, it was a, where I lived was a terraced house. Uh, the next picture will show you the front of the house so you get an idea of it. Um, and uh, I put up several aerials, but the one that worked best for me uh, was, uh, and I only used uh, a maximum of 100 watts, was some very, very thin wire, very, very thin gauge wire, probably 26 or 28 gauge uh, wire, some very thin wire. And I literally uh, slung a tennis ball with a fishing line over the top of my house and attached to it was uh, the, uh, uh, well, the fishing line went over the other side of the house and I was then able to pull the fishing line down from the other side of the house and pull up the wire that was attached to the fishing line. And I put up a delta loop. So I had a literally a 66 feet of wire that went from the apex of the roof there and came down. And you can just see in the bottom of the garden behind that conifer tree there on the left hand side is a six foot wooden pole. And I have one the other side as well, which is slightly out of the picture. And I took the two, two parts of so the wire came from the middle of the house down to the pole there, went across to the other pole, and then the wire went back up to the roof up there. And I literally got around the whole world with it. And neither of my neighbours, I don't think, had ever seen that aerial. In fact, it wasn't until probably um, only a few years before I moved away. I lived in that uh, QTH for about uh, 10 years. And only literally a couple of years before I moved, uh, one morning about four o'clock in the morning in the summer, there was a banging on the door. And uh, it was uh, my next door neighbor to get me up to say there was a bird uh, that seemed to be snagged on something in my back garden. And uh, so I went rushing out the back and inevitably a seagull had decided he was heading for my neighbor's big pond, fishing, uh, big fish pond, carp pond in his back garden, took up most of his garden. 
had obviously seen this and dived down for this, hit this wire going to the back of my house here and got tangled in it and was flapping around in this wire um, suspended from, uh, you know, about uh, 15 feet up in the air. Uh, luckily, I was able to uh, release, because it was still supported uh, down the other side of my house, I was able to uh, undo the, uh, the nylon uh, fishing line the other side and drop the wire down so the seagull fell to the ground. But it wasn't until the next day, having released the seagull, who, by the way, was unharmed, um, so uh, when I, I had to throw a towel over its head to stop it biting me and release the seagull, and then I was chatting to my neighbour the next day, and he said to me, he said, uh, I couldn't see what, your, what that bird was stuck in, Nick. He said, have you got something up there? And I said, yeah, it's a radio aerial. I said, I'm a radio ham, Peter. I've been playing with radios all my life. And he said, goodness me, he said, I've never noticed it before. I never noticed that there was a, a piece of wire that went from the, the middle of your roof down to the end of the garden. And I think that showed me that it is quite possible to put up very, very um, uh, uh, discreet aerials that uh, no one really notices are there unless you look extremely carefully and uh, you're in the garden to look. And he wasn't even aware of it after it been up for about seven or eight years. That was the front of the house. So when I was describing, I chucked the tennis ball over from the back, over to the front. Uh, I was able to climb out of my, my window there just to, uh, to grab the, uh, the nylon wine. I, I tied it here and that held it in the middle of the roof uh, space at the top there. So for that delta loop at the back of my house. I moved up here to Yorkshire um, three years ago and uh, we built, we bought a, a new build property here and I'll come to where the location is in Peniston in South Yorkshire later on because there's something quite uh, interesting about it. But I've got a garden, it's a bit bigger than that actually, it's about 40 feet, 40 odd uh, feet wide and uh, the fence at the end goes up the side of the garden by 30 feet and then runs further up to the front of the property. That's my garden, some lovely trees at the back there. Unfortunately, they're only, it's on a bit of private land, which is about five feet wide and drops down about 30 feet to uh, land beneath on which there's another small housing estate. But I built what uh, the Americans call these HOA properties, in other words, that when these build properties are built, there's a contractual agreement that is part of the contract of the freehold of the property that you're buying that prohibits, in my case, any external aerials being affixed to your property. So uh, the uh, TV antennas for all these properties were put in the loft space in the house and you're not allowed to have any external aerials at all. So that is clearly a bit of a problem. What I discovered fairly rapidly was that people started putting up uh, satellite uh, TV aerials. So they started going up on the back of the houses. So I thought, well, if people can put a satellite TV aerial up, I can put up a, a vertical for two meters and 70 centimeters, which is what I did on the side of the property, put up, as you know, a, a two meter half wave vertical uh, that will uh, transmit on two and 70 sems is literally, you know, three feet long, isn't it? Just under uh, a meter in, uh, in length, a small piece of aluminium, uh, very small indeed, definitely no bigger than my neighbor's uh, sky antenna. So if the, if the sky dishes can go up, my, I thought my two meter 70 sem aerial can go up, which it clearly can. But I did think there was more I could do with the garden. So my, luckily, my, my first thing was that in the uh, right-hand side of that garden picture you were just looking at uh, was planted a silver birch tree, which is um, currently about, I would say, it's about uh, 15 feet high, just, just over 15 feet high. Uh, because where I live up here on the uh, in the on the edge of the Peak District, it's very Peniston is very windy indeed, and uh, one of our other members, Ken, 
used to live in the town here, so he knows what the winds are like here up in Peniston. Um, I'm about uh, 800 feet above sea level where I live here, and um, we do get very strong winds. So as you can see, this silver birch uh, tree here, uh, which goes up here, uh, was um, supported by uh, a cane, uh, some bamboo cane, that is tied at various points right the way up to the top of the uh, to the top of the literally to the top of that tree to support it while it's growing because obviously it will get a lot bigger than that in time. Uh, otherwise, uh, without those supports, it would be snapped in half by the winds. But it occurred to me very early on that what I could do here was um, run a quarter wave antenna for 20 meters, a ground plane antenna for 20 meters. So I think you can probably just make up that there's a bit of wire running up the side of here um, that um, goes right up to the top of the tree. And that was what I first put up. So I literally put up um, a five meter approximate length of wire, 16 foot six inches to be precise, um, of wire which went to the top of the tree and um, at the bottom of the tree, at the bottom obviously was the garden and I dug lots of, um, took my spade to that grass in the back garden and put down a, a big pile of radials uh, of a similar length uh, that meandered around the garden and you can see the, the rough land at the back, I went over the fence and I dug some holes in the in the rough land at the back to stick some radios out the back as well. And that worked extremely well on HF. It radiated very well, tuned up very well, um, and um, I was very pleased with it. Inevitably, I thought, well, if I can get a, a 20 meter ground plane up, um, which didn't load particularly well on 15 and 10, why don't I do what the DX commander has done with his design and put up um, a ground plane, a white, simple wire for 15 meters and a simple wire quarter wave for 10 meters as well up the same tree, which is what I did. Uh, what you're gonna ask me is um, uh, what, what that did by put it, feeding them all in the same feed point, what that did to the, uh, to the SWR on the, uh, on the antenna it did affect it and I spent quite a few absolutely hopeless hours uh, taking wires down, adding bits to them, trimming wires off and concluding that I was facing a virtually impossible task made more difficult by the fact that to get the wire to the top of that tree uh, required me slinging a, a bit of fishing wire over with a weight on the end of it to pull the wire up. And it was quite a tedious progress to keep doing that when I was adding and subtracting bits of wire off it. And in the end, I decided I wasn't, I wasn't going to get a brilliant SWR on all three bands at the same time. 20 meters has been the HF band in the last few years that has been open more than 15 and 10. I thought that I would operate with an HF ground plane on 20. But if, if the 15 meter quarter wave and the 10 meter quarter wave gave me the ability to work on those two bands, which you did, that's what I would use. And, uh, and that was the antenna I used um, for my first couple of years. As you can see, I've slightly, and you can see the corner now in which the antenna is going. Um, I moved on a bit from that. And I think you might just be able to make out now, if you look where my mouse picture is on that, uh, at the top of that tree, there is a, let me just uh, see if I can get you something that's a bit better than this to have a look at. Um, right at the top here, you've got, you can just see the outlines of what of course is now a um, trap ground plane for 20, 15 and 10 meters. So what I've, what I've got now is a commercially made ground plane antenna with a trap in it for 20, 15 and 10, 
which it actually did give much better SWR across all of the three bands. But all of it is hidden behind the tree, so you can just see a little bit of the aluminium picking out at the top. I've put some plastic between the aluminium and the tree at the back so that it's not actually abutted right against the tree. Uh, there is some plastic um, holding it off from the tree, which of course can get very damp, but it loads up extremely well. And that is my main workhorse for HF operating, and I'm very pleased with it. What, uh, what I then realised was that you can see that fence at the back there, which, as I said, extends the width going from that side to the other side of the garden. It's, 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 it's between 40 and 45 feet in width. I thought, OK, what I can put on the back of that fence panel is a, um, a vertical delta loop for 17 metres. So that's what I put up, a vertical delta loop for 17 metres, which worked extremely well on 17. And I also found that it would load very well on six metres as well. Uh, luckily for me, and I think I just described that to you earlier, the, at the back of that fence is a bit of land which is about five foot in width. Um, and then it drops down by about uh, 25 feet to uh, to uh, land beneath so i'm i'm pretty sure i'm very lucky indeed that the the takeoff electrically certainly in this direction the antenna thinks it's actually 20 feet above the ground not six feet above the ground um, uh, supported because i've got it down in, in a vertical so you can just see down in the if you follow the square it says six meters on there if you just follow down uh, to the bottom of the fence panel, you can see a, a ballon in there, um, a four to one ballon, that uh, is, has got the feed points, the bottom points for that delta loop for 17 meters that is fed at the point down there. Um, and, and that worked extremely well. So we, so we went from an antenna that was for 20, 15 and 10 to a delta loop for 17 meters and also uh, operating on six meters as well. So there I've got, um, I'm not describing that as five antennas, that's only two antennas, but I've got five band operation. Uh, my club, Denby Dale, uh, were very keen on operating in the 80 meter CC contest. And because um, I enjoy CW, they said to me, why don't you ever go 80 meter C CW? And I wondered how I was going to do that and what I was going to do with my antenna. So I looked at my fence panel, and that's the top of the fence panel. And I um, built um, an 80 meter off center fed dipole. So the 80 meter off center fed dipole is 132 feet of wire. As you know, it's kind of fed at, at, at the, th the third point and one third one side, two thirds the other side. Um, and I literally stapled it to the top of the fence. So if I just take you back to that last picture, um, it's literally stapled to the fence all the way round at the bottom end and right the way up the sides that side and right the way up that side. And as it happens, the feed point for it is in the quarter, is in the corner of my garden over there. So I discovered that it will. Uh, load extremely well that 80 meter off center fed dipole and there is a slight problem with it and I'll come to that in a second but that worked extremely well again completely invisible and that would work well on 80 and 40 and it would I could load it on 30 meters as well not brilliant but it works reasonably well on 30 I don't need it for the higher HF bands because I've got the vertical and the delta loop so I then went on to try and work out how I was going to reduce uh, the cabling in the back garden. And uh, some of you may have um, seen that Ameritron sell the four-way HF remote switch box, which I think is, is a brilliant piece of kit. I bought mine secondhand, but uh, the, the, uh, you only need to have the uh, coax cable 
uh, from the shack into that box and that coax cable also takes the uh, control voltage for the relays uh, switching the antenna over uh, between the, the four different feed points. You can get a four-way one, I think they do a, a six-way one and a ten-way one as well, but four ways for me was perfectly okay. So as you can see, this feed box has got um, one, one uh, antenna, one piece of coax, which is the, the um, uh, goes to my shack, to the radio, and one of these goes to my uh, tri-band vertical, and the other one went to my 80 meter um, off center fed dipole and of course one of them also another feed point went to the delta loop at the back all switched from the shack again pretty well invisible in in the house uh, the only problem i had and i this is again i'm i'm one of those people who prefers to build things so most of my balance i build myself the only problem i had with my off uh, center fed dipole on 80 meters was that when I decided to put a bit, little bit more than 100 watts into that ballon, I think because the antenna I've put up is rather compromised in terms of the shape of the wires. So they, the feed point is down the bottom here. It's going up and then wiggling around the corner and up the side. This one's going around that side and up the other side. It does produce some pretty high voltages at the bottom, which I discovered when I put um, probably not 400 watts through it, maybe 250 or 300 watts of HF into that. It worked for a bit and then I suddenly discovered it wasn't loading at all and it was the, uh, the antenna was behaving bizarrely and I wondered what the hell was going on. I assumed it was something at this end as you do and I went back to look outside and when I looked at the feed point of the, the ballon, um, I discovered that um i'd completely blown it up it was completely melted and the voltages were so high it had it had melted over inside so i i you know carried on building getting larger ferrites and uh, heavier gauge wire and uh, rewiring these balance but having similar problems and in the end having read about it i discovered that um there is um there is a design uh, called HF Design uh, Ballon. I think this, now I'm going to get this wrong. I think it's the DX shop that sell these. I might be wrong about this. Uh, but they've built a, a ballon which is both, uh, it's jointly a voltage ballon and a one-to-one -one current ballon uh, wound uh, specifically with a very high rating covering and uh, Teflon tubes with a total breakdown voltage of 10,000 volts, um, they uh, specify on their ballon. And I bought one of those, and I've never had any problem whatsoever with that off center fed dipole running higher power through it when, when I want to run high power. I generally work, work QRP. I'm often on five watts and 10 watts, uh, but I do run 100 watts and I do run 400 watts, uh, depending on how I feel and what conditions are like on the bands. Uh, so I, kn I know I can put 400 watts through that and I don't blow anything up. Uh, the other thing I've done, as you do on properties, is I did have a look at uh, putting an off center fed dipole in the three sides of the guttering. So at the back of the house, that's my plastic guttering at the top that goes across the back of the house and I then ran um, because it was you know 40 foot 35 foot whatever it is I can't remember now uh, the width of the house uh, across the back I then did run the wire around the sides so I got enough wire in to put a 40 meter off center fed dipole up it did work and it loaded up and it transmitted but on receive it was hellishly noisy and I'm, I, I know we all suffer with noise that we are making ourselves in houses. One of the problems you get in new build properties is they, they, uh, they build uh, these properties with um, uh, fans in all the bathrooms and toilets and kitchens um, and tell you that it's very important you keep these on, particularly in the first few years of living in these properties because there's still an awful lot of damp in new build properties uh, from the plaster and the building work that's gone into the construction of a new house from scratch and they tell you it's important 
uh, to, to get the right balance to operate these fans. And of course the ones in the bathrooms. So I've got um, uh, three bathrooms. Uh, we've got a, a, um, uh, upstairs here and uh, they, they've all got fans in that automatically kick in. And I just found that it was very, very noisy indeed on receive. It really was not an antenna for receive. And in fact, uh, if I've now compared, as I have done, that 40 meter off center fed dipole to the 80 meter one, the 80 meter one is better in all respects. It's quieter on receive and it transmits just as well as the one that is in fact higher up on the, on the guttering of the house. So inevitably, I'm a radio ham. Um, I, I want to carry on playing with things. One of the bands that in the last, um, uh, certainly the last six months to a year has started to open up a bit more is the 17 meter band. I enjoy 17 meters as well. Uh, and uh, 12 meters too. And I did wonder about whether or not uh, my, um, uh, my delta loop is working as well as I'd like it to work. And uh, so I, I, I made for myself uh, a, a fan dipole for 17 meters and 12 meters. And that's in the middle of my fence at the bottom of the garden. So the fan dipole runs down the back of the fence at the back of the property which no one can see. And uh, so I've got one wire, uh, one half wave dipole for 17 meters and one for 12 meters fed into a ballon. And of course the cable dropping down to that same Ameritron switch. I've now run out of, of uh, coax switch points because I've used, I've used all four of them. Uh, but I've compared the, the 17 meter fan dipole with the 17 meter delta loop. It's slightly different. So um, what it's doing uh, in terms of uh, radiation is very slightly different. Uh, I think on balance, I'm, I prefer the 17 meter uh, dipole um, and I prefer the, having the separate uh, dipole for 12 meters. Uh, the SWR is very good, uh, even without uh, the ATU and with the ATU is absolutely perfect. Um, but um, it's, I think it's slightly better, but slightly different. I'm a CW operator. Uh, I use uh, the reverse beacon network all the time to put out CQ calls and have a look. And I use that for comparing aerials and seeing where one is getting, where the other's not, what the signal to noise ratio is, because you can get it in real time uh, between a real transmitted signal, whether you're operating five watts or 400 watts. Uh, the uh, you can, you can compare the, uh, the, uh, the antennas. I think probably my favorite for 17 meters is that fan dipole at the, at the back of the property there. So I'm not sure how many aerials I've got to at the back there. So if, we're, if you're toting them up, uh, we've got the, uh, the tri-band vertical for, uh, for uh, 2015 and 10. We've got the 80 meter off center fed dipole. Uh, we've got the delta loop for 17 meters, that's three. And we've got the two dipoles for 17 and 12, that's five antennas. Um, as you can see, I've slightly cheated here because that's no way a stealth antenna, but it's on one of those MFJ poles uh, that um, is, is down at the six foot spot. So isn't really noticeable by my neighbors at the side. Uh, but when it's dark and when I operated in the um, 144 meg uh, UK AC a few weeks ago. I literally put that up to um, uh, 15 foot and I've got a five element beam on two meters and nine elements on 70 SEMs, but I am 800 feet above sea level. So very nice takeoff um, from the QTH there. So I can't really claim that to be a, a stealth antenna. Uh, before I finish, just a, a stroke of luck for me here. Uh, where I live is in a very small um, uh, market town called Peniston. Uh, it's about 10 miles north of Sheffield, 10 miles south of Huddersfield in South Yorkshire. Uh, Peniston was just on the edge of the uh, amazing uh, steel industry. Sheffield, of course, people will know is the, the world center of the steel industry from the 1800s onwards. Uh, but in Peniston, this is a picture of the Peniston Steelworks. 
that was that was called the English Steelworks went up in the 19th century, late 19th century, uh, got uh, uh, turned into camel leads. It was pulled down and redeveloped by camel leads, uh, and uh, and then redeveloped by David Brown. And in fact, during the Second World War, uh, was the factory uh, not looking as it is here because that was an original steel um, foundry that was on the site. Uh, but is the factory that built um, engines for the uh, casings for the Spitfire engines, uh, built tank casings and bomb casings. And uh, this railway line here that um, went down to Sheffield, it's disused now, but there's there's a tank ramp about a um, quarter of a mile away from where I live here uh, that was used to uh, uh, move the tanks that came out of the factory onto the railway line and uh, move them down to the south of the country to take them out to Europe during the Second World War. But this factory no longer exists. Um, it, it was pretty well um, uh, pulled down. There wasn't none of the original stuff here was left. Uh, but um, my, my estate of 30 houses is literally where that, where that steelworks is in the picture here. So we don't have all that railway line. We've only got a single track railway line going through Peniston now. But where that big chimney is, that's pretty well where my house is now. Uh, that's where I live. And uh, one of the things I think that I'm, I've discovered digging down into my garden, when I've dug down a bit uh, to plant things, uh, including wire cables in the, in the garden here, is that I keep bringing up bits of, of iron and steel that are in the ground here. And I suspect that deeper down than I'm getting to, but, you know, at least, you know, six, ten feet, maybe deeper down beneath me, is a shed load of steel and iron from going back to the 19th century from the old steelworks here that is considerably helping uh, create a ground plane for my HF antenna. So I'm getting extremely good radiation from the HF antenna. Um, and I'm, I suspect it's not just my my simple little wires I've buried in the garden, it's, it's quite a lot of serious uh, steel and uh, stuff that's in the bottom of the garden. So there we go. Um, the answer that I was given there was five. So going back to um, the largest answer that 44% of you gave was, was two antennas. Uh, there were a few of you, I think four people suggested five. So I'll be interested to see what you think you had spotted there, whether you, whether you had guessed um, that uh, there were some antennas there that you couldn't see. So um, I'd just like to, to finish on, on this note, uh, well, two, two bits really. Uh, first bit is, and this is what Darren and I were saying to Andrew, our M7 in our club uh, on Facebook this morning. Uh, one of the great things about antennas is that you can play with them to your heart's content. And it's not very expensive to buy a reel of wire, and it's not terribly expensive to go buy some coax, and it's not terribly expensive to, to wind a, a ballon, uh, or if you want to spend some money to buy some, and some, some of them are very good uh, that you can buy on and aren't too expensive. And I would very much like to encourage people to have a play and just see what you can squeeze into locations you've got and see what will work, what will load up, and what will actually work in practice. Um, and that's, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm coming to with my talk here. Inevitably, um, Steve Nichols, you may well know from uh, the RSGB uh, and uh, his books he's written. Uh, one of his great books is his book on stealth antennas. He gives lots of great ideas about stealth antennas and, and I've, I've looked at his book and got inspiration from it. But I think my main inspiration that I take from Steve's book on antennas, and in fact from any book on any antenna construction, is have a play. You know, it might be very difficult to build nowadays and quite a complex job to build, you know, an HF all band uh, transceiver for all modes uh, yourself. That might be quite a quite a task uh, nowadays to build one uh, that uh, that can do that and and a feat beyond many people. But you know, building antennas and playing with bits of wire is something we can all do. And I'd like to really strongly recommend that uh, people do give it a 
give it a go. So Phil, um, that's my talk and I'll stop sharing and hand the chair back to you. Nick, that was brilliant. And it's, <laughs> as somebody else has recently commented, uh, it's given me some ideas. Um, before we hand over to everybody else for questions, I've got one for you, Nick. Um, Obviously your antennas, many of them are along the fence panels, wooden fence yep. panels, yep. but doesn't the, uh, the dampness of the wood at different, certainly different times of the year, but you know, when it rains or whatever, doesn't that affect the SWR? Um, funnily enough, I don't find it really affects the SWR on the 80 meter one, the long one going around the top of the fence. The one that really does struggle with the rain is the, and it struggled, not just as a, uh, a wire um, quarter wave, but the one in the tree, that struggles. The metal, the aluminium pole against that tree does struggle. And this year with the snow as well, we had you know, quite a lot of snow and ice up here uh, in Peniston over the winter months. Uh, and I did find myself having to, uh, to retune my antenna pretty regularly on HF, not, mass, not a massive amount. So the SWR would vary a little bit, but it would vary noticeably. You know, we'd go, you know, I could get a, you know, pretty well a one-to-one -one match very quickly. It would drift up to, in snow or uh, heavy rain, it would drift up on the, on the HF 20 meter antenna, maybe up to, 1.2, 1.3 to 1 SWR, it would move around a bit, but you could bring it down very quickly just moving the, uh, the, uh, the ATU. One thing I have discovered, and I started off with, uh, when I lived in my previous QTH, I brought with me one of the uh, commercial automatic ATUs, I think it was one of the MFJ ones, uh, which worked very well, I uh, didn't have any objection to it, uh, but I did find that um, the using one of those automatic ATUs is more of a problem than using a manual one. So I've I definitely find, uh, and one of the problems with the automatic ones, of course, if you're not very careful, they start kicking in. So when it was when it was wet with the automatic one, it was you could hear the relays clicking across, and it was trying to retune itself and find the perfect match again. And I didn't find that terribly helpful. So I did find that having a manual um, ATU works a lot better. But yes, it is, it is affected by the rain and damp, but it's, the effect is not as big as you think it's going to be, Phil. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, I see Mike has got his virtual hand up. Mike, G4FVG. You can unmute. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Can you hear me OK? It's Mike, G4FVG. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, thanks, and uh, thanks very much indeed for the talk there. That's, that's great. Uh, thanks, uh, Nick. Uh, you mentioned about uh, operating from a flat, though, uh, earlier, and the, um, and the joy match. Uh, I'm actually located in a flat at the moment with no guard, and all I've got is access to one window uh, from the shack here. Uh, is it still the joy match, or have you got any other thoughts, please? <laughs> I lost the joy match some years ago and in fact um, I don't know if you've had him talk at Newbury yet if you haven't you should get him uh, Terry G3 ZPS from the Cray Valley Club uh, restores old radios and he gives a fantastic talk on the on the old radios he loves the old stuff you know the KWs and the uh, the original valve radios so if you haven't had him Phil um, uh, then uh, definitely get him to come and give you a talk. He asked me if I still had my joystick. He hadn't actually met anyone who had used one in the way in which I had. And I said, sadly, I've lost, I've still got the ATU, but I lost the joy match some years ago. I mean, there are, there are other opportunities now, I think. I mean, probably two things I've tried um, outside um, uh, windows is uh, if you've just got an op one opening window, one of course is a piece of wire dropped out of the window. So it depends on how high up in the flats you are and whether you can drop a piece of wire that doesn't go over someone else's window. Um, but that's, that's, some, that's one thing worth trying. Um, the other thing I know I've done in, in someone else's block of flats is a fishing pole out of the window uh, and um, putting that up when I want to operate and pulling it back in when I 
when I want to stop operating so I could put up a, a longer piece of wire on one of those you know six meter fishing poles and then just just bring it back in when I want to stop operating um, I, I'm probably not alone um, I, I actually at one stage in that block of flats did have an aerial that I had running in the bedroom where I was operating from in the going round the top of the top of the ceiling I had a 20 meter dipole around the top of the ceiling and while it did load up I mean one of the problems maybe the construction of those 1930s blocks of flats in London was somewhat more substantial than modern building construction but in those old 1930s blocks they are solidly built you know the brickwork is solid in those things um, and I, I did struggle funnily enough with that with the dipole in the ceiling space where I did much better with the with the with the old joystick uh, but I think nowadays I would try a, a wire with a fishing pole and put that up particularly at night time when it's unlikely to be seen and then just pushing it back in when you stop stopped, stopped operating yeah okay thanks for the thought there that's yeah, okay thanks Nick. that could be um obviously a useful idea to uh, think of um uh, yeah I'll bear that one in my area thanks for that I'll okay Leave it for the others now. Many thanks and thanks for the talk. Okay, cheers, Mike. Nick, a couple of questions have come up in the chat window, uh, which are very similar. Um, and that's to do with almost a swear word in our club at the moment, the Ofcom uh, EMF <laughs> calculations. Yes. Um, and, and the obvious question in your uh, scenario, because you've got your antennas, you know, five or six feet off the ground. Yeah. Um, have you done any calculations? Yes, I, yes, I have. I mean, I'm perfectly okay, of course, on QRP. <laughs> Uh, so um, <laughs> all of these are absolutely uh, no problem whatsoever on five watts. I can guarantee you that. Um, th there clearly is a problem uh, with the antennas. I mean, luckily for me, uh, two things. I don't have a neighbour down one side of the garden. And on the other side, I've got neighbours who own another property up in Cumbria and uh, spend quite a lot of time disappearing up there. So, you know, when I know they're away, I'm completely Ofcom compliant as long as no one's in my garden. And that's for me to determine, isn't it? You know, I can, I can see my garden from the shack window uh, and I can determine whether anyone's in my garden. Um, uh, and most of the time it's just myself and my XYL. So uh, uh, particularly when the weather's bad, she's definitely not in the garden. Um, and, and I can, and therefore, and therefore I can be still completely compliant with Ofcom, even putting 400 watts uh, through the antenna. Uh, but I, I obviously need to exercise some caution. Um, but, um, uh, and it would be a problem, of course, uh, if my neighbours were in their garden next door, if I was putting 400 watts through the antenna, six feet above the ground, running along the boundary of their garden. Um, that clearly would, I would not be compliant with those uh, Ofcom regulations and therefore would not be doing it. But yeah, so there, there clearly is a, there, there clearly is something to challenge us there. But you know, when you look at those, I know you've probably discussed the ad nauseum, Phil, but when you look at those, uh, the Ofcom requirements, you know, it, it is about ensuring that we are compliant. So if I can be certain there is no one within the, the range of the, uh, uh, the radiation from my antenna, uh, then I'm compliant, aren't I? So yep. whether it's whether it's one meter, two meters, or five meters, as long as I am certain there's no one within the range of it, I'm compliant with the Ofcom regulation. Absolutely. Okay, I'll, I'll pick one more question out of the uh, chat window. Then uh, Chris has got his hand up, so we'll come to you next, Chris. Uh, question here is. I'll just read it straight out. Have you tried loaded verticals and loaded dipoles for lower frequencies? And in addition, small loop antennas for lower frequencies? Mm. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, first of all, um, not, not in this QTH. So uh, as you remember in my previous QTH, I had a, well, not a loop, not a magnetic loop, but I had a, a you know, a, a 40 meter um, full size loop uh, with very very thin wire that really was not seen by anybody at all in fact it was still up when we called the um the state agent round to sell our house before we moved that wire was up and the state agent never noticed it and in fact i 
I mentioned to him as he was going, I said, oh, by the way, do you think I should take my radio aerial down if we're going to get people come and look at the house? And he said, what radio aerial is that? And I took him out in the garden and pointed up to the, the 40 metre loop that came from the, uh, the roof. And he said, I hadn't even noticed it, Nick. He said, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, so um, I, I think the answer is, um, no, I haven't tried a magnetic loop. I, I know there are people successfully use them. We've got one of our club members, one of our American um, members who's joined us in, in, uh, in the last 12 months, um, Bob N4XAT. He uses a loop antenna on HF running 100 watts uh, very successfully. Um, I have tried a loaded um, a vertical antenna. It operates okay, but I find the full size quarter wave ground plane works better, definitely, than a loaded um, antenna definitely works better. Um, and my 80 meter off centrified dipole definitely works better than the 40 meter one I had in the roof guttering. Um, one of the questions I got or asked was um, uh, whether how I can successfully operate an 80 and 40 and, um, and not just make NVIS contacts. In other words, you know, I'm getting transmission going straight up and coming straight back down again. Um, I, I am finding I am regularly working DX definitely on 40 meters with that 80 meter off center fed dipole. Um, just in the last um, few weeks, I've, I've worked into South America and North America uh, in both cases at least once a week uh, on CW on, on 40 meters uh, using that 80 meter off center fed dipole six feet off the ground. I, I'm, I'm pretty certain I've got an advantage that many people will not have in that the longest stretch of that 80 meter off center fed dipole, you know, the, the element at the back of the garden, the, the 14, 15 meters of it, uh, which basically drops down at the end of my garden down 25 feet, doesn't, it doesn't believe it's six feet off the ground it believes it's 30 feet off the ground and, and that's why it, it works well. But I would still say to you, even if you haven't got that advantage in your garden, but you've got a fence like that, just try it. You know, stick up a, stick a wire, staple a wire around it like I've done, feed it with a bit of coax, stick five or 10 watts through it and just see how it operates. And I think you'll be amazed the contacts you can make on it. Okay, thanks, Nick. Let's go over to Chris, G8AJM. You're on mute. Thank you, Phil. Uh, and thank you, Nick. Fascinating. And I recognise an awful lot of what, what you've been saying today. I just wanted to add a bit more support to the just try it um, uh, philosophy. Um, I, I've been using an off centre fed dipole for, uh, I guess, about six years now, which is about the time I've been back in the hobby. And um, the garden um, is only big enough, or the entire plot is only big enough to support what I would call a proper 40 meter off center fed dipole. So that's where I started. Um, and much, oh, and, and I should say, I, uh, my, my problem is not so much having to make it stealthy, um, although I make it as stealthy as I can um, <laughs> for domestic reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's more that I'm, I just run out of room. But, but a 40 meter off center fed fits very nicely. The pole on the side of the house, uh, the, the one third leg goes out nice and straight. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a V shape, but that's fine. Does everything it should. Much to my surprise, it was the first time I'd used an off center fed. Much to my surprise, I discovered I could load it on every band down to six meters and including six meters yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, quite remarkably well. Um, and then I, I got into, well, uh, heard about the 80 meter CC contest and thought I'd love to give those a go, but I'll never get an 80 meter aerial here. But I thought, how do you, how, how do you turn 40 meters into 80 meters on a dipole where you just make the bits of wire twice as long, don't you? Mm -hmm. So I did, did exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, nothing more scientific than that. I just literally doubled the length of, of each leg, uh, but there wasn't enough room. so. It, it sort of did a double take on a fence, came back again, 
uh, underneath where it had been suspended <coughs> of and, and so on, worked a treat and still worked on all bands down to six meters. Mm -hmm. um, then realized that um, I'd love to have a go at top band because I'd never been on top band. And I thought, well, you're never going to pull that trick off again, are you? Uh, in, in, a, in what is essentially a 40 meter home. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to load the 80 meter version uh, on top band and the ATU just wouldn't have it. it as we, and we all know that shouldn't work anyway. Um, but I thought I'll never get 160 meter wires in, so l let's just detune the whole thing and put a random length of wire on the end of it, each end. And damn, it, it worked. It, it's absolutely worked. And I've, I've been having a ball on top band. I can still work every other band down to six meters. So the, the whole point of what I'm saying is, um, as you said, just give it a go to see if it's going to work. And, and the off center of fed dipole does appear to be very forgiving. Uh, and if you've only got a chance to put one antenna up, then maybe that's a good choice. Uh, and, uh, sorry, I, I did have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> have, have you tried to get 160 out of, out of your aerials? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it, it, uh, my 80 meter off center fed dipole will work on 160. Oh. Um, not very well, I really, must admit it doesn't work that well so i've tried operating qrp on 160 and i have made a few contacts but i it's it's never really going to properly work and i don't i can't quite see i've got the space sadly and what i will say to you is and i agree with you i personally think the off center fed dipole is a much underrated um aerial um uh, with all due respect to uh, the great Lewis Varney, G5RV, uh, and Bob, uh, N4X18, new Lewis Varney, uh, so I, I don't want to be um, unpleasant about his memory, but I do think the off-center fed dipole trumps the G5RV for the ability, exactly as you described it, to, um, to work on basically all the HF bands up that you've got available. So if you if you make a an 80 meter off center fed dipole, you you can work on everything from 80 to six. The same's true from the 40 meter one from 40 up to six. It will it will load up very well on all bands in a much neater way than the G5 um, RV does. And I think the other advantage the off center fed dipole's got is that because you've got a fee point a third of the way along the the uh, the wire if you're starting at the side of your house and one third of it is going along one side mm. the coax the, the coax drop down is down the side literally off the side of your house it's not in the middle of your garden yeah. and of course you know it's a piece of coax hanging down in the middle of your garden that looks more intrusive than often than the than the piece of wire that you've got up so in terms of getting an aerial which you're putting up in the garden which is showing as little as possible to people about what's going on the off center fed dipole has got lots of advantages so i, I agree with your comment there jeremy yeah can i add in a couple of constructive uh, things here and one challenge um what is it in the states they use a lot more full-size uh, loops uh than we tend to in this country and, yeah. and i have certainly tried them and they've been very good very uh, very good they don't necessarily have to be very high but a full a delta loop traditionally is is one wavelength round as a triangle and yeah. they can be square they can be circular they can be any yeah. shape you can you can fit in your garden they can go along the top of a hedge they can go on top of a fence um and the other thing is which i've never tried is to use the counterpoises where you could actually zigzag a counterpoise um, a log fence down four inches back along down and along as long as you space them out uh with good spacing they, it, it sees the whole wire whole length of the wire rather than as a solid mass and you can lose a, an 80 meter counterpoise really quite easily in that sort of space uh, my, my challenge is you use the word loading very things load very well uh, and i'm not a techie person but i assume you mean that your ATU tunes it down to a low SWR. Um, 
uh, my dummy load is a has a very excellent SWR of one to one. It doesn't <laughs> make it efficient. Um, you can load with an ATU, you can match the impedance at the antenna. Um, it will it will seem to be fine, point of view, of not blowing your rig up. But it, you know you can load the screwdriver up. It doesn't make it very effective. And it's not efficient. So I think you have to be a bit cautious about. Yes, I you know my antenna is multi band. It does two meters to top band. Brilliant, but uh, so is my dummy load. I, I, no, I, I, Jeremy, I absolutely agree with you. Um, however, the, I mean, two, two things I'd say to you, the proof the pudding's in the eating for me, I'm a radio ham, I like making contact with other radio hams. If I build something and it appears to provide, my ATU will match it, as you say, because an, that's what an ATU is designed to do. If I'm not getting any contacts, there's one of two things going on. Either I'm not radiating any signal or HF conditions are absolutely diabolical. Um, if HF conditions aren't diabolical and I'm not getting a single contact, there is something wrong with my aerial that is not working. So, you know, that, that's when you have a play and that's when you change something and you change the, the length of the wire or the, the, uh, the shape of it uh, to see what is different. Um, I, I go back. I mean, I, I don't... I've never, I, I played around a little bit with Whisper, um, but, um, and I, I don't use the FT4, FT8, but, you know, I, I am a CW person. The reverse, I can't say enough how useful the reverse beacon network is for playing with antennas. Because literally, you know, I, I can do what you've just said, Jeremy. I can get, you know, my ATU to give me a lovely match on that bit of wire I've just strung around the garden. And then I can put out a CQ call and I can see within 10 or 15 seconds where that's getting to when I'm operating whatever it might be, 5 watts, 100 watts or whatever, whatever power I'm using. And literally all I have to do on the reverse beacon network is just, you know, tune away you know just two or three killer cycles and put out another call with a different antenna and I can instantaneously compare the two and I can see signal to noise ratio and I can see where I'm getting at any one time so you know when I when I put out a CQ call you know I'm I always check the reverse beacon network just to check for myself the whole lot is working properly and it's not just the fact the ATU is showing me I've got a nice um, clear one-to-one -one SWR but also the signal is also getting out so I agree totally 100%. Okay um, maybe if I can interject here uh, normally our meetings sort of finish um, between now and 9.20, 9 uh, Well, we've got two more people with hands up so perhaps if we could have some quick questions and answers that would be great. We've got Gerald G3SDY was the first one with his digital hand up. If you can unmute Gerald. Just done that. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Nick. Great talk, and thank you to the guys at uh, NEADRS for letting us watch it. Watch it. Um, just a quick point: the 80 meter dipole I used first of all on 160 meters when I first got my license in '63, and I used it by strapping the feeders and loading it as a T-shaped vertical, and it worked quite well. And uh, it was a good way of getting on top band. Didn't work m m great DX on. 10 watts of AM, but uh, I managed to get into Kent, which I'm told is a long way south of here. Anyway, um, the, the other thing is, um, fed half wave and, the, and the, cent, uh, the off center fed aerials have another advantage in a sense that the current portion of the aerial is what radiates most, mm -hmm. nearest to where your coax feed is coming down, and it'll pick up some of the radiation from the aerial. So but by moving it further down the wire, towards the end, uh, the, the coax or whatever feed you're using will radiate less. And I just wondered whether um, you'd had any attempt at trying a end fed half wave um, as well and comparing that to the, uh, um, what was it, the um, two thirds feeding point, uh, Nick, over to you. Um, yeah, yeah, funny enough, Gerald, uh, literally um, last week, um, I, I thought, I mean, I use an NFED half wave often when I go walking. So I take a pole with me and use an NFED half wave with, uh, with a QRP radio up in the hills. And that works brilliantly well. And I thought, you know, I've never tried it in the garden here. I'm just going to give it a try. So I, I literally um, ran a wire 
um, out of one of the windows upstairs down at the end of the garden and sat in the garden with my my uh, my radio at the bottom of the garden and gave it a try and I was able to switch between that and um, one of the other aerials so I think I was on 20 meters and I was comparing it to the the ground plane and the ground plane was definitely working better than the NFED half wave um, and I came to the conclusion that I think the NFED half wave works better um, when you've got a clear piece of wire so it's, it's really nicely suited to go at the top of a 10 meter pole and come down to the ground the other end and it, in my experience it works a lot better um, fed from coax from the top of the pole and not from the other end of it um, uh, through a matching a 49 to 1 matching transformer um, and that works extremely well but so when I looked at the logistics of that in terms of what the garden looks like I came to the conclusion it doesn't give me any improvement but I did have I did I did I did look at it for exactly that reason how does it compare thanks thanks Nick um, one last question we got here Ken G4 BZV <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much, and uh, thanks, uh, Nick. Yeah, for uh, that, that was a good, uh, um, uh, very good uh, thing about the antennas. I just wanted to um, just mention that I put on the chat about uh, two antennas that probably not many will know about. One is called the Bailal antenna, and I put the website on uh, on the chat. So, so you can actually click on that and look at it but these are antennas that are maximum size three feet six inch and that's to cover 80 meters as well uh, they're basically a tuned circuit it's a coil made up looks a little bit like a bird feeder but the pro the thing about these antennas is that they use the feeder as part of the antenna and if the feed is running down the side of a fence probably wouldn't be seen by a neighbor as well um, and then I think the idea there would be to put a common mode uh, ballon choke ballon near to the station end so you are allowing the feeder cable uh, on the braiding to be used as a radial but then you're stopping it entering into the station. Um, it was those two antennas that I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention and the EH antenna are single band antennas that look like a little tube of about four or five inch diameter uh, in, and um, they work on the same principle. Some people think they're dummy loads but um, it's whatever radiates. I'm not say whether the dummy loads or not but does it radiate if you look at eham.net and look at some of the reports of the bilal they're given five out of five on absolutely dozens and dozens of reviews and the only other thing is possibly for consideration would be a vertical wire thrown over a tree branch and uh, at the top of that wire, uh, put a few capacity hat wires. So you probably won't see the wires. And the old saying that the older you are, the less good your eyesight is, I can confirm that my neighbor didn't see my wire outside, which is an inverted V, half of a trap dipole, and only noticed it last week, and it's been up six months. So it just proves that uh, if you've got older neighbours who've got bad eyes there, they're not going to see some of these wires as well. But just a few comments anyway. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Can I just, just say to, uh, to everyone else, um, the reason why Ken's neighbour probably didn't notice that is because they're transfixed by your 10 element delta loop antenna for two metres, Ken. <laughs> yeah. So they're well, slightly, they're slightly, they're slightly looking at that one and not at the other one. <laughs> but no, you, you, you. I mean, there are, there are some fabulous ideas around, um, and uh, uh, you know, with, with uh, very, very small antennas, 
Um, uh, and I, you know, they're, they're definitely worth trying. I, I think, I think it's very, I mean, I've just finished on this point, Phil. Um, I think it's very difficult to think of a location where we could not, a group of people that's in the room here tonight, couldn't come up with some working antennas that would work virtually in any single location, however small and however compromised it might appear at the first sight and would radiate very well on HF. And I think that's, that's our challenge really, is to play with the space we've got and see what we can put up the works. Thanks, Nick. Um, Darren, if you have a very quick question, uh, I know you've got your digital hand up, uh, go for it. But uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was waving earlier as well, but I, I didn't realise you were responding more to digital hands. Uh, yeah, once again, Nick, excellent presentation. It's the second time I've seen it, and if you do it again, I'll watch it again, because it's different every time. Fabulous. Um, I played a lot with the um, offset centre feds. Uh, I've always found them a lot more noisy than a straightforward dipole. Um, so that, that, was my first, that was my main comment, really. Yeah, I mean, I, that may be the case, Darren. I, I can't say I've, well, I, I, got, I guess I've got my dipoles, my 17 and 12 metre fan dipoles now to compare that with the off centre fed dipole. Um, I, I haven't tried it, but I know obviously my, my 18 metre off centre fed dipole will uh, operate on 17. So I'm going to try that now. I haven't compared what the noise level is like between that and the, uh, and the dipole. I suspect the dipole is going to be less noise. I think your, the resonant dipole is going to be lower noise, but I'm not 100% certain. But I think you, like, be, think you could be right. Like, sounds like a good, good afternoon at Farnley. Yeah, definitely. Wait, wait for anybody who's not, who doesn't know which, yeah. that's how a sort of contest stuck... Um, um, uh, field day site. Yeah, good idea, Darren. All right, thanks, Darren, and thank you to everybody else for your questions. Uh, I can judge that there's probably lots more questions in there somewhere that you'd like to be asking Nick. Um, I'm sure you've all got his, uh, or many of you from Denby Club anyway, you can contact him direct.